Welcome to the Birth Launch Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts and learn how to craft your ideal birth. We will tackle the scary and weird questions that come up along the way and provide answers that are driven by science and evidence-based recommendations. I'm going to show you how to redefine parenthood and choose what's best aligned for you and your goals. With 10 years of experience in family education and a master's degree in human development and family studies, I'm ready to help you navigate pregnancy and explore your birth options to free yourself of fear surrounding childbirth. My goal is to help you have an informed and confident labor experience, plus an empowered and joyous postpartum. Hello, have you heard about my completely free class that teaches you six evidence-based ways to avoid a C-section and reduce your tearing in labor by up to 50%? And remember, I mentioned it was completely free. This class is going to teach you how to advocate for your preferences in the birth room so that you can have a birth that's filled with joy and not birth trauma. Advocating for yourself starts with being empowered with the right information so that you can ask the right questions and confidently make decisions during labor based on what feels good to you and your baby. But here's the thing. The U.S. has one of the highest C-section rates in the world, and it is ever climbing year after year. And it's not because the system is broken, albeit it is, but it's really because women don't have the tools to navigate that broken system. We may not be able to change the system before you have your baby, but what we can do is change how you operate within that system. Change the conversations that you're having with your providers. Change the places that you are getting your information to help you have informed conversation with your doctor before you have your baby. I want to teach you how to do that. We know the reasons that our C-section rates are climbing. We know the reasons that inductions happen so often, and we know the reasons that babies end up in the NICU. I want to help you avoid all of that so that you can have a birth that you love. You can find my free class at thebirthlounge.com backslash C-section so that you can learn six evidence-based ways to avoid a C-section and reduce your tearing in labor. Again, that is thebirthlounge.com backslash c-section see you there bye Paige. welcome to the show thanks so much for having me i'm so excited to dive into this conversation we were just talking about how we're like kind of long-term followers of each other and you actually knew me from an event many years ago pre-pandemic that's insane i love 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 i talk about this all the time but the power of the internet to do good things i know there's a lot of bad stuff that comes from it too but the good things the connections that we otherwise would not have made i absolutely love that all right today we're covering the topic of mental load and motherhood and it Ugh, I don't know. Something about it feels icky to me that we still have to advocate for this stuff. But then a piece of me is like, hell yeah, we should be having these conversations because if men don't know, if society doesn't know, if legislators don't know, then somebody has to educate them. It kind of sucks that we have to be the one to educate them. But then who else better to educate them than the people who are living it? So I've got so many feelings about mental load and motherhood. I want to touch on all of it. I also would love to leave people with actionable steps of how do we actively get our partners involved? How do we truly motivate them without, dare I say, nagging? Although I know you have feelings about nagging. I, I do. Videos, you just have so many great videos of perspectives that I think – a lot of us are not exposed to. And so if we're going to truly change our family dynamics and we're truly going to start living in a household that makes us feel fulfilled and feel joy and feel so in love with our partner and feel balanced and feel respected in all that we do, a little bit of it has to come from us too. So let's start there. Can can you speak to the person who is out there listening being like, oh my God, yes, I have so much mental load. I don't even know where to start. Sure. Yeah. I think for most women in particular, and I say women because they tend to carry the bulk of the mental load, is we don't even know how to put words to what we're experiencing, right? Women are feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. They're feeling resentful. They're feeling frustrated. They're no longer feeling intimate with their partner, right? There's all these things that happen, right? And they feel like they're happening to you. And oftentimes I think this happens to women with children, but not always. It can happen to women who don't have children as well. But I remember chalking some of it up to just being postpartum, 
being a mother. And this was just it, right? Like this is how my life was changing. And these emotions and feelings were tied to that. When in reality, after I was able to take a step back and understand what was happening to me and, and my family, I could see it was very systemic, right? What was happening wasn't an individual failure on my part or my partner's part. It was a failure of the system, right? Like of marriage, of family units, the way they are built these days, and just also just the infrastructure that doesn't exist to support mm -hmm. families and birthing people. And so I think first and foremost, if you can put a name to it, then you're already kind of ahead of where so many other people are because so many people are in it and they don't even know how to express what's happening to them. If you're able to recognize what you're going through, the beauty of that is you can start to have conversations. And I think that's really what it is, right? When I say it's not an individual failure, it's not for you or for your partner, right? I think oftentimes we'll hear this narrative, which is you shouldn't have married a deadbeat or you should have married a better guy. And I think in some cases, that's probably true. Sure. Some people yeah. marry men who are not great. <laughs> like that's, that's true. But for the majority of us, I think we felt really confident going into marriage and parenthood with our partners and we're rocked by the inequities we felt after becoming parents. And so much of that comes from the way we're raised, the way society talks to us, the way we view employment versus caregiving. Those things are all compounding that, that lead to us feeling this way. But at least if we have the words, we can start to talk about it. And I think these are difficult conversations to have. So I will say that I always advocate if you have the resources to do it, which I know is privileged, but like therapy, counseling, all of those things are going to be totally. beneficial. Like having those resources is huge, but if not, there are still ways to talk about this and to course correct. My best piece of advice though is to learn about what the mental load is before you are married and have children. So that way you can hopefully kind of get ahead of that conversation and not end up where I ended up, which was drowning in, you know, domestic labor and caregiving and feeling very unseen by my partner. Yeah. Okay. Let's dive into that. So a lot of these people who are listening are pregnant. What if you've never thought about this mental load? What if you're like, I don't, I mean, it, it can't, probably not going to happen to my family. Like my partner's great. What kind of conversation should we be having? Even if you have a stellar five-star husband already. So I think it starts, especially for mothers, but the second you start trying to conceive, if you think about it, right, all of the responsibility and accountability it often ends up on the woman in this situation or the birthing person, right? They're saying, are you tracking your ovulation? Do you know when your fertile window is? Do you know your cycle? Are you on birth control? Are you getting off birth control, right? It's all on her to decide. Whereas men can be equally a part of that conversation, but often they're left out of it. And right, so it starts early when we think about kind of, how I call it, like the mental load of motherhood, right? It starts very early where we say, well, it's my body. So of course I'm the one doing this, but it doesn't mean you can't be having conversations, right? And involving your partner and having them be a part of knowing what your ovulation cycle looks like. Like they should know when you're ovulating, right? Like share the app with them. I don't know. It shouldn't just be on you, mm -hmm. right? And so like, I really advocate for starting this early, way before the kids are here, even before you're pregnant, because- it all adds up. And what I think is, you know, from that trying to conceive phase to the pregnancy phase to then the birthing, it all starts to pile on mom. And it feels like it's her responsibility because she's the one carrying the baby. When in reality, a lot of these things can be shared. And what I think is most helpful is truly kind of treating your marriage and relationship. And some people will say this is kind of like taking the romance out of it, but like treating it like a business. Like this is a family unit that needs to function. We are something that needs maintenance. Every relationship needs care and thought and effort. And so it's not just about intention. It's actually, it's about how you show up. Like how did you show up? And so I think, you know, domestic labor is easy because I don't want to say easy easier because you can put it on paper and say mm -hmm. like you do trash I do dishes you do dogs I do kids uh, you know definitely not kids kids and dogs are not the same but you know <laughs> you go and <laughs> that is that is easier when it's just two people and it's easier to kind of have that conversation before kids because you can start to get on the same page about how you share domestic labor right and that can help inform how you tackle parenting, because you can do the same thing, but everything gets harder in a sense, right? There's more laundry, there's more dishes, there's more trash, there's more of everything when you have kids. But if you were already able to kind of divide and conquer and you can carry that forward with you, I think you're a step ahead of the game, which I think is really helpful. I'd say a second to that is just 
making sure your partner's aware of what this is. What is the mental load? What is it? Are you thinking about a sleep schedule for our baby? Are you thinking about whether or not we're doing formula or breast milk? Are you thinking about, are we doing baby led weaning or, you know, solids or not? What are we doing? What, what are we doing? Not allowing it to become a situation where like mom is the boss of the baby and delegating to dad, right? Because that doesn't end up typically creating an equitable kind of division of parenting. And it just kind of snowballs from there. If that decision-making also isn't shared, because that's a big part of the mental load too. That's so interesting to think about the difference of truly educating and empowering your partner to be an active participant, an active parent in the role versus just delegating. Because I think so many of us, like right now, me, I'm like, wow, I totally would have just delegated, but that actually didn't teach him anything that actually didn't do our baby any good. Because once they grew out of that phase of life, now those instructions are not good. I want my husband to think about, okay, as my baby grows now, what do I need to be thinking about now? What do they need now? How do I continue to be an active parent where if you've just given instructions and delegated the task, hoping for an end result, once you're out of that phase, they don't have any transferable skill. That is wild. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Talk to us about, I tell yeah. us, tell us. Yeah. You know, my husband and I went through this where like my husband's a very active parent, you know, he's always here with us, doing everything with us, you know, tubby is bedtime, all of it. Like he's here, he's doing it, but he didn't own anything. Right. And I remember we had a conversation once about how I didn't want him to just show up. I wanted him to be informed. Mm. I don't want to make decisions by myself. I don't want to ultimately be the only one thinking about what's best for our children, right? And, and I'm not the expert just because I am mom. We can both be experts on this and we can come together and share our thoughts and opinions. And I, I think this goes well beyond the baby years, right? I think the baby years are the toughest because there's just so much happening at, at once and it's, it's such a huge adjustment. But I've even found with as our kids get older, right? My my daughter, the way we talk about food in our house, right? I had really strong opinions about how I want to talk about food and body image and all of these things with our kids. Because as a woman, I've been drastically impacted by the way my parents talked about it and the way mm. they treated food. And he didn't necessarily have the same opinions I did because he grew up in a completely different family unit. They talked about it differently. And so we clashed, right? Like we clashed. And I remember saying to him, okay, you're coming to me with opinions. I'm coming to you with opinions and informed information, right? Like I've read about this. I've been like, these are the accounts I follow. This is the book I've read. Like I'm happy to have a discussion, but come to me with something. Mm -hmm. Come to me with something, right? Because I want to feel like we're in this together. And so I think encouraging men or our parents in general to be an active part of the conversation, not to just have opinions too, but to be informed, to actually say like, Hey, you know, I was really weary of baby led weaning because my, one of my biggest fears is choking. It just is like my number one fear with kids. I can't be around a gagging child. It freaks me out. Right. And I, that's a personal problem. Like that's, that's a me problem. No judgment. No one's judging. <laughs> but, but right. Like if my husband came to me and said like, I really want to do baby led weaning. I would have been open to it. I would have just said like, well, why? What, what, you know, why? How are we going to do it? Are you going to take the charge on this, right? Like, what does that look like? But he, in that instance, like, especially with our first biological child, he didn't, you know, he didn't come with that. He's like, so what are we doing? And I'm like, well, we could do this or we could do this. And he's like, well, which one? And I'm like, good question. I, I don't know, right? And so like, I think that's the thing. Like, it often ends up being like, mom is the final say. And ultimately when that happens, the responsibility and accountability ends up on her too. And, and so it can be a really tricky situation, I think, to navigate. Well, I also imagine that letting go of control is probably a large piece of this because as you're talking about these things, I can see them unfolding and I could see myself being like, yeah, I'm glad I get to make the decisions. But then I also see down the road how if we've not both been empowered to make decisions, when I don't have the mental capacity to make the decisions, he's not empowered to do so. So it does fall onto my plate because no one else feels like they have the authority to do it, to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think it's also the messaging we get, right? As women that our ultimate job is that of a mother 
right? Like our job, our calling, everything that we are is to be a mom, right? And like people say, it's the greatest gift to have kids and it's the so much more important than your career, right? But they're not saying those things to men, really. Like they're not saying, oh my gosh, it's so valuable for you to be home with that baby right now. Mm. They're saying that to mom, right? And so it also puts all this pressure on moms and birthing people to deliver on that, right? Like, okay, this is the thing I'm supposed to be good at. Totally. This is the thing I'm supposed to know, but I don't know the same way my partner doesn't know. I've, people have commented on my videos and I'm sure you've gotten this comment too, which is like, we became parents on the same day. Like we became parents on the same day. I don't know more than you. <laughs> like I don't have more information unless I look for it. Right. And so I think, yes, it's partially control, but it's also about how parenting is reflected on the individual oftentimes mothers are judged. If we jointly decide to formula feed a baby, the judgment will not be on my husband. It will be on me, right? And so that is where I think the control comes into play too, which is we feel like we want to control the narrative, especially as it reflects on us as a parent. That's so unfair, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Infertility is the same thing. Having kind of like a bad birth experience, even though even if it wasn't in your control, it all kind of reflects only on the mom, even though it was very much a together event. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I, I had infertility. I had two ectopic pregnancies. So I have no That's fallopian right. tubes. Oh, thank you. And we had traumatic births and all these things. Right. But like, I was really lucky because my partner was with it in mm -hmm. me. Right. But nobody also expected him to know like what was going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they, they were like, Oh, like, is Paige good? And he'd be like, yeah. And they'd be like, okay, cool. And then they'd come to me and be like, so what's the next steps? And like, what do you do now? And like, are you going to be able to have kids? And I'm like, why am I, <laughs> why is everybody asking me all these questions, right? Like it's, it's a combined effort here on, mm. on how we proceed now. It's not just up to me. And so, yeah, it's really interesting because I think, yeah, to your point, so much of it can feel like a personal thing when it really is meant to be a team effort and a joint kind of adventure that you're going on together. Yeah. So what kind of advice do you have for people out there who this sounds really good and they want to do this, but then when they think about kind of giving up that control, they're like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Where where do you start in that journey? A lot of it's going to be self-reflection. You have to be mm -hmm. self-aware and able, you know, in order to be able to give up that control and trust your partner, but are there mantras that really helped you? Were there books? Were there resources? Who, you know, where were the things that you turned to or what were the things that you turned to to help you get to this place? Yeah. I think there's a different path for everyone. But for me, the thing that made the biggest impact was I read Fair Play by Eve Rodsky, which for me, that was the moment where I was able to put words to my experience. I was able to say, wow, this is not a me problem. I'm not the only person experiencing this. And what I loved about Eve's book was that it not only helped me kind of to put words and understanding to why this was happening in my marriage or the dynamic in my marriage, but also systems and tools to, you know, course correct essentially. And so she has a game. It's the fair play game. It's a card game that you can do to help navigate changing kind of this unequal division of labor. And my partner and I did a version of it. We didn't do it to a T. We didn't do everything specifically how Eve does it, but we used it as our kind of like guideline of how we were going to tackle this. And essentially what you do is you go through a list of household tasks and duties that have to do with your children. And you each essentially put your name on one, right? So I did it in a spreadsheet, which is why I say put my name on it. But in the game, you do cards, right? Like, so he has his stack of cards and I have my stack of cards. And the beauty of this is, you're supposed to have conversations about each of them, right? Like, okay, groceries. I was controlling about groceries because every time he grocery shopped, he wouldn't get things my kids would actually eat. And I'm the person who does breakfast and lunch. So I'm like, you are putting me in a position to fail every time you grocery shop. And I'm having, like, I'm trying to have grace with you, right? But you're making my life really hard. <laughs> you're making my life hard. And so- you have to talk about the tasks, right? Because he raised his hand. He was like, oh, groceries, I can do that. That's easy. And I'm like, yeah, it's easy, but you're not doing it well, right? And so then that's the second part or like one of the parts of it too, the fair play method is there's this idea of like a standard of care. What is the minimum standard of care? What do we agree is the minimum level that you have to meet for this task to actually be done, 
to actually consider it being done and done well, right? And what I've really taken away that I kind of try to take into my even just day-to-day life, not even with my partner, is everybody's level or standard of care is different. And oftentimes you'll hear the narrative that her standards are too high. She has too lofty of expectations for her partner, for her kids, for her home, whatever. And so one of the things Eve said was, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to take something from like her law background, which is it's not about us. It's about the average person. If the average person walked in here, saw that task, would they think it was done to the minimum standard of care? Would an average human being? So like whenever, you know, I do something or he does something, I think like, okay, I'm irritated by the way he did that. If my sister walked in here, would she think it's bad? <laughs> would my would his would his sister think it's not up to par? Would his best friend think like who, what would the consensus be around this task? And it might be different, but as long as it's kind of meeting what we believe in our family and just in general that the average person would think is acceptable, then it it probably is right. And everybody's going to have a different tolerance for this kind of conversation based on personality types, right? But I think that was a big one for me too in the control aspect, which is, okay, some things aren't going to be done the way I would do them. And that's okay as long as it doesn't have a negative impact on anybody, right? As long as my kids aren't negatively impacted, I am not impacted, then it's okay. We're all okay. It's fine. I use that same approach when it comes to parenting things too. So swaddling your baby or the way that they feed your baby or (laughs) the way that they hold your baby or put your baby to sleep or bathe your baby or change their diaper, literally any of it. Um, The order in which they even like do tubby and bedtime, like, you know, unless there's something like you were talking about that drastically, you know, impacts sleep or it's dangerous for your baby or there are long-term things that they haven't thought about. Just remember that your partner can do things differently than you and it doesn't make it wrong just makes it mm-hmm. different and that's okay for your baby your baby you want your baby to get used to people doing different things you know obviously within reason yeah yeah within reason <laughs> yeah. within a realm of, of expectations okay there was one thing that you said and I want to touch on just because I'm eager to hear what your thoughts are but you said Kids are not dogs. And I agree with you. I totally, I would never try and be like, if you've had a dog, you're ready for a baby. (laughs) Yeah. You're not. But what do you think about using a puppy, not as a test, but just as kind of a barometer of your skills, problem solving together and caring for a creature that requires your attention. They obviously become a little bit more self-sufficient way faster than a child. They don't have language. You don't have to put them in school. You're not in charge of Mm -hmm. socializing them necessarily. But, you know, in terms of just like a light, you know, can we do this? What are your thoughts behind that? Yeah, I actually think if I had paid more attention to how my husband and I cared for our dogs, I probably would have had a better idea of what was coming <laughs> my way. Trans, like totally. We had two English bulldogs and they were high maintenance dogs. They just were. Totally. They had to wash their faces and clean their ears. And like, they were just so much work and I loved them to death, but they were a lot of work. And one of the things my husband said he would do like every day was like, I'll clean the dog's ears. And every single day I had to say, did you clean them? Have you cleaned them? Are you going to clean them? And he'd always be like, just get off my ass. And I'm like, well. Just do what you said you were going to (laughs) do. Yeah. I'm like, her ears hurt. When you don't clean them, she scratches them and then they bleed. Then we have to go to the vet. Like, this is a snowball effect. I need you to do what you said you were going to do. And if you're not going to do it, then I'm going to do it. Right? And it wasn't that. My partner's also neurodivergent. So, like, we have very different ways of operating. Right? And... It's one of those things where I was like, I've asked you a thousand times to take care of this dog. And I know you love this dog because I know you feed her off your fork. Like, I know you love her. I can see that. (laughs) But you're not doing things that are in her, like, best interest right now. And that's what's frustrating me as her mother, right? And so I do think not in entirety, right? Like, kids are just this whole other beast. But you can start to see where things kind of fall through the cracks. And if you are actually looking with a critical eye, if you're if you're doing it and you're thinking, okay, if I were to step back, amplify this by a thousand, would I be okay with this situation at hand? And if your answer is no, then then you know you've got some work to do. So I do think having to be responsible for a pet or something outside of just the two of you can show you things and inform you on what maybe you need to kind of work on. They're not the same, but they, but it's the same idea, right? There's work involved when you have 
you know, we just, my dog's sleeping behind me somewhere. I don't know if you can see him. We got this puppy last year and he just became mine. Like somehow, um, because I work from home. Default. <laughs> yeah, default parent to the dog and the kids. I work from home. And so he just became mine. And I remember my husband complaining about something because I was like, you need to do this because that's what I've been working on with him all day. And he was like, oh, he's fine. And I was like, I am home with him for 10 hours a day by myself. If I tell you this yep. is how I'm training him, this is how I'm training him. I was like, unless you want to do the work, you don't get to tell me. And so, you know, it, it's one of those things too, where it's like, I think some of the control aspect of this like greater conversation too, or the, the ownership aspect comes from the fact that when you've already put a lot of time and effort into doing something for a very long time, you feel really connected to that thing, which sounds silly because it's like a task, but it's, you feel so connected because you've spent so much of your like blood, sweat and tears on it. And when you watch somebody else do it different than you, that can be hard because you're like, no, that's not how I do it. Please don't. Totally. I mean, it's also just kind of something's become your habits and it's like your day is based around that. And if you don't do it this way, it's not going to turn out that way. And that way is dependent on this or my nighttime yeah. is dependent on it coming out that way. Or I need the baby to sleep to this time of the day because Right. I have this meeting or whatever it is. And so when people come in and kind of trip up your processes that you have in place, that can be really challenging and feel really anxiety provoking. I think there's a lot of space for people to step back and say, okay, exactly what we just said, doing it different is not bad, but there might be a, need, a conversation needed to say like, okay, but when you do it this way, it does mm -hmm. cost me more work down the line. Exactly. I think that's the the greater picture, right? Which is with my husband, I had to say like, you might think it's silly that you got a different brand of yogurt, but I just had three screaming toddlers crying in the kitchen at 7 a.m. and I have to get to work and you're not here, right? And so it's not having any impact on you, but it's having an impact on me and it sounds silly, but it's real. And, you know, if they can't see that, if they don't know that's why you're frustrated, then they don't have the full context, right? And so if I just got mad, and said, you always get the wrong thing. Like, I hate that. Like, you're not going to do groceries anymore. It doesn't fix anything. It just means I'm going to continue doing more work. And he never learned why it matters to get the right yogurt. <laughs> and so I think you have to be willing to have those conversations too and, and give your partner the benefit of the doubt, which is they didn't intentionally get you the wrong yogurt to destroy your morning, <laughs> right? Hopefully. And so you <laughs> have to assume with all of the information, they'll they'll do something different. Okay, you just said they don't understand why it matters or it's important to lead them, help them understand why it matters. You have videos online talking about what I call like covertly disrespecting women. And you yeah. talk about it a lot in the way that partners either do it, you know, intentionally, maybe not with malintent. The golf video comes to my mind where yeah. they're like all golfing and they had all told their wives that they'd be home at a certain time. And it was like they were joking and filming this this video 90 minutes to two hours after they had told their wives and they still had time to play golf. Like they were still saying like, oh, I won't be home for another hour and a half or so. And you had just talked about how that is so disrespectful to women. And I think that men don't only do it in these really kind of loud ways and very obvious ways like that, but sometimes it's very, you know, whether it's intentional or not, it's almost sneaky ways. It's covert ways. It's ways that we don't even recognize are disrespectful. Can you dive into that? Start with that golf video. What were your sure. feelings about it? What did you think when you first came across it? What's the message you want us to take away? And then what are some examples of things that partners do that might be causing women to feel resentful that maybe they don't even know. And, and and they could take this and say, oh yeah, he does do that. And I think I would feel better if we had a conversation about it. Yeah. The golf one is so interesting because I feel like it's universally understood mm. that golf is this thing that men sometimes feel like they have the right to. I have the right to go play 18 holes with my guys on the weekend because I work hard all week and you know I get that time. And I think the hard thing about this golf conversation is it paints the picture that women hate when their partners golf. And I want to be clear before we talk about all of this, that I don't hate golf. I don't even hate that my partner golfs. Like I encourage him to golf. But a reoccurring conversation I had in my house with my partner was, when you tell me you're going to be home at a certain time, I expect you home at that time. 
If you know a round of golf averages between three to six hours, then tell me six. Don't tell me three. I don't want best case scenario. I want you to under promise and over deliver. I do not want to be disappointed by what happens today. So just tell me what you believe to be the truth, right? And what I said to my partner was, when you don't tell me the truth, right? This whole video was, what time did you tell your wife you're going to be home? And they all say three o'clock basically. And it's six, 6.30 and they're still not home and they're laughing and they're drinking beers on the golf course. And what I said to my partner was, every time you do this to me, right? I have planned according to what you've told me. I have scheduled the baby's nap around what I need to do tubbies for the other kids. I have planned to prep dinner when you are home because then you can help me with the witching hour for the baby or, you know, whatever it might be. I have planned according to what you've told me. I've scheduled the rest of our home around what you've told me. And when you tell me something that you know is not true, because this is what I think happens oftentimes, and I hear it in the comments from men, they would rather tell you a lie and have you get mad later than tell you the truth and have you either say no or complain about it right now. They don't want to not be able to do what they want. So they're just not going to tell you the truth because they think they'll get a yes. I used to say this to my partner. I don't want you to appease me and want you to tell me the truth. Don't tell me you think something you think I want to hear because this happens too in domestic labor. Mm -hmm. but yes, every day I'll do the dishwasher. And then Six Nothing. out of seven days of the week, he didn't do the dishwasher. And I'm like, stop telling me something you don't actually intend to follow through on. Because what that does is it leads to me not trusting you. And it's little promises you break over and over and over. And then your partner ends up resenting you mm -hmm. and not trusting anything you say, mm -hmm. right? Like now you're no longer a reliable source. And so what I think ultimately this comes from, again, is society, right? We value men's time oftentimes more than women's. What does it matter when I'm home? She's just cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kids. What's the big deal? She doesn't have any real plans, right? As if what she's doing is not valuable. And what he's right. doing is because he's with his friends and he's golfing and that's the time he's earned. And so that can be a really frustrating part of the conversation too, which is, you know, in our country, women do the bulk of the domestic labor and the caretaking for kids and men have way more time for leisure and recreation and hobbies. And even you think about marathon running, Ironman, all of these, you know, extreme sports, they're often predominantly done by men because they have the support of a female partner taking care of everything at home. Right. And so you don't often see as many women being able to do that until their kids are older or fully grown. Right. Women will say, Oh, I had time for that when my kids grew up, but you don't often hear men saying that. And so it comes down to respect, right? If you tell your boss you're going to do something and you don't, your boss is now going to either dock you or have a conversation. You'll end up on performance plans. Like these things happen, right, in other contexts. But with our partner, we're willing to just keep doing it and kind of like pushing to see how far you can take it. And I think it's really it's really harmful. And and like I said, that's the golf thing, right? Like it's and it happens in many different ways, but it's a level of disrespect saying one thing and doing another. I think you can communicate right? You can say, Hey babe, I really thought we were going to be done at five. It's looking like six. Or what you could do is you could disappoint the guys you're golfing with too, for the benefit mm, of wah, wah. Yeah. Right. You could <laughs> oh, say, Hey, no, my family needs me. Oh, exactly. No. <laughs> exactly. Like, Hey, I promised my wife was me home at five. It's four twenty. I got to hit the road. I'm out. Like go. enjoy the rest of the round. Yeah. Like that's not the worst case scenario, right? Like why is that the worst case scenario and not dropping the ball in your family. And so I think it happens too, though. Like I said, like on the dishwasher or whatever, you know, I, my husband used to, he said he would do the dishwasher and he would empty it in the mornings, which was helpful to me because then I'd have all the dishes I need for the kids and for myself. And I wouldn't have to spend extra time doing it. And he wasn't doing it. And I remember him saying like, oh yeah, sorry, I've just been running late for work every day. And I'm like, you don't think when you don't do it, it doesn't make me run late for work, right? All that's day. Exactly. All day. Exactly. I'm like, when you don't do it, it means I have to do it, which even if it's only 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes of my time and I'm doing the kids by myself in the morning. And so now it's 10 minutes of my time and the kids time. And now we're going to be late for the bus and late for school and late for work. And I'm like, you're one person. And if you can't show up for this thing, then like, what can you, right? <laughs> like it was my, my like ultimate, like it wasn't the most graceful conversation I had. Like, I was like, this is, if you can't do this, you're useless to me. Like, please, like, just but do the dishwasher. But it was honest about, like, yeah. if you can't do this small task, 
you are eroding the trust that when a big task comes along, I'm going to be able to depend on you. And I need that assurance, not only from a partner, but from that feminine masculine standpoint, from the division of labor standpoint, from an equal household standpoint, it matters to show up in the small moments for sure. Hey, one thing you keep saying that we haven't talked about is after you have a baby, mom's life changes drastically it's a new life you're literally Mm -hmm. in a new body you have new brain chemicals so you're thinking differently right your sleep is totally foreign everything is new your schedule you're not going to work which is a whole nother conversation about child care and all that jazz but you know say uh, on this topic your life is totally different you are a new person with a new human in a new life for men it's really not kind of like that. They kind of get to go back to life almost as normal. You might mm-hmm. have a paternity leave or a parental leave. And um, obviously you have more responsibility with a baby. But if you're lucky enough that you get to leave for work, once you're parental leave, you're kind of back to normal, except in the hours that you're at home. Um, but as your husband had in the morning, you're just kind of responsible for yourself. Mom will get the baby up. Mom will feed the baby. Mom will mm-hmm. feed the kids. Mom will dress the kids for daycare. Mom will drive the kids to school. So for men and women, the process, the transition into parenthood looks very, very different. Really it different. Does. Yeah, it does. And I think it starts early too in the way that we talk to moms and dads after birth, right? And I'm sure you see this more than I've only given birth twice, but you know, in the hospital room, like they're asking me, mom, how are you doing? Mom, how's the baby? Mom, is the baby eating? Mom, is the baby doing this? And I'm like, can you ask that guy over there, like who's holding the baby? Cause I'm tired, <laughs> right? Got like it. ask him how she's eating. Mm-hmm. Ask him if she had a diaper or not. Like, why is it always just directed at me? Right. But it sets this precedent that it's my job. It's mom's job to know, right? And then when you come home, you know, I, my friends probably think I'm so annoying because a lot of them are starting to have kids. And I'm like, hey, I don't care if he goes back to work tomorrow. He should help you at night. His time and his paid job is not more important than your time at home with this baby. You need to recover. You need to be well rested to take care of your child. If you're breastfeeding, you need to be well rested. That's taking so much of your energy. Like, Your partner doesn't get a pass on the overnight wake-ups because they go to work tomorrow. But that is so often what happens, right? It's that whole conversation of how we view time. Because oftentimes men are in this like caregiver provider, not caregiver, like a provider role. And they're they view themselves as being valuable because they provide a paycheck. And so that time is more valuable than the time she's spending at home with their children. But they're equally valuable. Like I don't care if you're paid multiple millions of dollars a year, your time at work is not more valuable than your partner's time with your kids. And I think something that I say a lot and some people have thoughts on is, you know, your job and your paycheck does not give you a pass on parenting, right? Your child is a choice you made and you having a job does not get you out of doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and overnight wake-ups and sick days with your children. Like that is parenting. That is not a job. That is that is what you've chosen to do. That is a role you've decided to take on. Because what I hear a lot is, well, I work full-time and she stays at home. So it's her job to take the kids or know their medical history. And I just like can't get on board because I'm like, they're your children. They're your children. You should care and want to participate right? You can, you can be a dad or a mom and not be a parent. I think that is something that can be true, right? And we all have, like, not all, but like a lot of people have that where they're like, yeah, like, hey, dad, but like, uh, you know, <laughs> like, was he, was he there. involved? Yeah, like, was he involved? <laughs> like, nah, you know, debatable, right? You hear that all the time and that's the difference, right? There's parents and then there's the people who gave birth to you or, you know, helped to create you and they're not always the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so, I also like to say that, which is like, it's great if you provide for your family financially. That's amazing and it's important, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't care about your parenting style or if your kids wake up at night or if they're sick. Like you should, those things should still take precedent over your paid job. Definitely. I agree with that. I also don't know, you know, me personally, I don't have children either for everyone who's new listening. I don't know that I take necessarily offense to someone saying like, that's my job to take care of my kids, but that's a job that I want. And mm-hmm. I think that's a big difference is like, I look forward to being a mom and, and kind of staying home with my kids. And I, I think that I'll really enjoy that environment. And so I 
feel good about that title. I can see that if someone felt forced to stay home with their kids because, you know, you didn't have the money for child care, which we will talk about in a minute. But something that I think is very striking about this is saying because you earn a paycheck and because there is money that is attached to your job makes your your work more valuable. It's kind of bizarre to me because while your partner at home may not be being paid, we can easily calculate what that would cost you. You should Google what does child care cost for your age child? And it differs yeah. whether you have a baby or a five-year-old to make sure you're doing those calculations right. Make sure that you're having a cleaning service come in for two to three hours once a week. You can't get away with once a month, unfortunately, if you're trying no. to replace your <laughs> stay-at-home partner, right? So every single week, you're going to need a laundry service. You need somebody to walk your dog. You're going to have to hire somebody to take your children places. And these people, need to be certified and doing things safely. It can't just be like some Joe Schmo off the street. So you're right. really going to have to pay for the safety there. So you can easily calculate if you are someone who's listening, being like, well, I bring in the money. Yeah, your wife probably saves you a shit ton of money too. So if you want to talk about dollars attached to jobs, just make sure that you're coming to this conversation fairly is all that I ask. Yes. And I think I, I'm in agreement with you. Like I view my job as a mother as really important and I, I am thankful to have it, but I also think it's important for dads in particular to also view it as a job that they're excited to have. Sure. Right. And so, coworkers kind exactly. of. Exactly. And I think another layer to this like income conversation is oftentimes men will say like, I work hard so she can stay home. And I would like to flip that conversation a little bit, which is like, she stays at home, which allows you to work hard. And then they'll say, okay, well, like, you know, my job's really important. It's how we eat. And I say, great. Well, you'd have your job, whether or not you have kids and a wife. The question is, you can do it with them or without them, right? But you wouldn't be able to have the house and the wife and the kids without the the work she's putting in, right? Like that part would go away and that's okay. You don't have to have all those things, yep. but you cannot have one without the other if that's important to you, right? If you want the sure. wife in the house and the kids, then both are required, not just the paid job. And so I think it's that conversation, right? We always put, it's like the chicken and the egg. Which one do you need? You need both. You need both. They're both valuable and important. Yeah. It would be a whole lot easier if we were in a country that helped families out in doing <sighs> that. Yes in not making childcare inaccessible through tuition or just pure scarcity or, um, you know, not paying our citizens enough to actually be able to afford the things that they need to properly care for their family without having to choose to stay home. And I think that that's what our team finds a lot is people do want to go back to work. They want to go back and like be purposeful with that part of their life again. But when they run the numbers, it doesn't make much sense. They can just stay home and be with their baby and give up their career, which is often a really hard choice for women. And I think, you know, that's just another pointer to the way that men don't have that same pressure. It, it's very rarely are you asking a man like, oh, well, are you going to go back to work? Of course he's going back to work. It's just expected where a woman always has that pressure of, well, will you return to work? Well, then who will take care of your baby, right? And then for families, it's like, well, how in the world are we going to afford that? Right. Well, it's, we're also in, in an economy where like most families need two incomes. And that's the other thing. There's this, you know, a lot of women want to be stay-at-home parents. A lot mm -hmm. of dads want to be stay-at-home parents, but they cannot afford to because the cost of housing and the cost mm. of groceries and the cost of everything, right? Everything's expensive right now. And so there's that conversation, right? But if you have, I think there's two situations. There's like the privileged situation where it's like one of you earns enough to allow the other to stay at home, right? Like you have that financial situation, which is a choice. That's a choice people get to make, but it's not without risk, right? Whoever stays home loses a bit of financial freedom and potentially their retirement or career growth or wage growth, right? Insurance. There's a risk. Totally. All of it. Exactly. There's the opposite side where it's, they're not privileged. They literally can't afford to continue working because of the cost of childcare, right? And so then they take a finance, like women or men are forced out of the workforce and it's not what they want, right? And so there's two versions of it. And I think oftentimes- depending on your life experience, you you view it in one lens more frequently mm. than the other. But I do think they kind of exist separately. But in both cases, there's financial risks, there's social and emotional and like mental health things that come from being forced out of the workforce. So I just think there's a lot to it. I think there's 
so much the conversation. And I think so much of it also comes just from the lack of infrastructure and funding for families. I mean, there is not accessible childcare for most people. You know, I personally had kids on wait lists till they were two. Like my youngest just started daycare. She's two. Like she's been on the wait list forever. And, you know, I... I'm in the privileged position to be able to pay the astronomical amount that I pay for childcare. And that that in itself is difficult. Finding childcare is difficult. And then there's the cost of the childcare that's difficult, right? And then there's the cost to staying home. What does that mean if we stay home for us for long term, short term? What does this mean? Right. It's a huge, it's a huge conversation I think families are having right now and people who want to be parents are having because it is determining how many kids somebody has, when they're having those children, where they're living. There's there's a lot of people who are moving close to family so they can have family support to care for their children, totally. which, you know, that that's a blessing, but some people don't want that either. They're like, actually, I wouldn't really like my family to watch them, but it's the only option I have. And so there's there doesn't feel like there's really freedom. It's just everybody's picking the the version that works for them right now based on their financial capacity and their village or support that they might have around them or not have around them, depending. Like what an American brand. That's so on brand for America. It's like- Best of luck. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like, welcome to America. This is what we have to offer. Take out your will. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, do what you will with this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That I'm sure you you hear this. I hear it all the time. And it's like, you chose to have kids. And it's like, <laughs> I was like, first off, in our country, like some women don't have reproductive rights, right? So like there's that part of the, not everybody's choosing to have these children. Sure. And sure. then when people do have children, right? My older two are adopted through foster care. It's like the supports that we give families, it, they just don't exist. Like I think about the way that their birth mother did not have the support, right? The financial support, but the way that I as a foster mother did. She did not get the same support that I got as a foster parent. And so I think we're failing children and families in so many different ways that that really could be avoided. It's just the American way right now. Sure. We just need policy change and we need better advocates and we need to reallocate money that is mm -hmm. already out there in the system but is going into – deep pockets or right. you know hidden places instead of back to the american people which is so so sad wow this i think this conversation has been everything i wanted it to be i really do i love the way that you present this really i don't even know i i still don't have a word for it like it is an important topic but it's yucky that we still have to talk about it and it's infuriating that so much of it is so covert, but it's also like hopeful that a lot of people don't know that they're doing this. And so if we just educate them, hopefully we can make some leeway. This is, it's interesting. Women's mental load and the mental load of motherhood and the inequities just in that family dynamic is something that I've always been fascinated for or about. And I talked about it a lot when I was getting my master's. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing about just your experience and the the research you've done and how women can, I think, better take control of their household in order to give up some control and bring their partner into the conversation. I know yeah. that sounds weird, but it really, this conversation has been super empowering. So Paige, if people were interested in connecting with you, you're on TikTok and Instagram. How can people find you? Yes, I am on TikTok and Instagram at she is a page turner and you'll find me on both. I'm pretty active. <laughs> I love that. Are you a big reader? I, I try to be. I have four kids. So what I what always happens is I end up falling asleep with my Kindle like on my face and my Literally. husband's like, you need to shut the light off. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, it's time for bed. I yeah. do audio books a lot. And the, yeah, in place of like podcasts and stuff. So that's fun. All right. Truly, this conversation has been so much fun. I really appreciate you being here. But you guys connect with Paige on Instagram. You can find me at Tranquility by Hehe or at the dot birth dot lounge on Instagram. And we're at Tranquility by Hehe on TikTok. All right, you guys. We'll see you next episode. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time on the Birth Lounge Podcast. Until then, head over to Instagram and find us at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow. You can also check us out at thebirthlounge.com.